Good morning. Let's all stand and join in as we sing. This is the... This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made, that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord hath made, I will rejoice and be glad. This is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. Blessed assurance, but before we do that, everybody turn and look at Miss Diane. Let's make her feel conscious. Okay? Everybody on this side look that way, except for this side. And y'all look toward the center. Everybody over here, look at these folks. And y'all look at them. Say, Happy Mother's Day. God loves you in spite of yourself. <laughs> I was talking to y'all, too. <laughs> Amen. Isn't it glad we can laugh in God's house? Amen. Let me tell you, God is a spirit of divine intervention. And at your lowest ill, he can make you laugh. He can make you smile. And he can teach you to love right from your heart. Whether that is your desire or not. Because he is a great physician. Amen? Amen. Happy Mother's Day again. And let me tell you. I had the greatest one ever born. I'm so sorry that offends you. But I did. And I'm going to tell you. I was a mama's boy. And most of y'all that know me. Know that. And I am proud of it. Okay. I was so much like my mama, you could put us in a room for three minutes and it was a cat fight. <laughs> y'all ever, y'all ever had that problem? But yeah, don't, I know, but that's, that's just the way it is. That's what my wife, every now and then she'll say, Grace, and she ain't praying. That's my mama's <laughs> name. Okay? So you know what? Regardless of your circumstance today, aren't the flowers beautiful? You know what? I'm going to say something whew, close to my heart. Give your mama a flower in person. Put it in her hand. Love her and hold her and tell her that. There's nothing wrong with a memorial. I love her. But let me tell you what's more important. Let her know you love her today while she's still here. And you treat her with respect that she deserves. Amen? Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Play Blessed Assurance. <laughs> Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh 
tell you what I told the choir. Just make something up <laughs> and sing it. And just in case you don't know, I can see the TV back there, but that's about it. So if I don't have a book, I'm kind of in trouble. Amen? So the choir's going to sing, but not only is the choir going to sing to God, we want you to help us sing to God this morning. Amen? Can we do that? Miss Judy? <laughs> so good to see everybody this morning for all of our guests thank you so much for joining us today as we 
worship the Lord and we give thanks to his name for his amazing grace. If it weren't for his grace, we certainly wouldn't be in this place here today singing praises to his name. And I trust that this morning you know personally and you've experienced personally the, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I want to second what Brother Ricky said by just thanking all of our mothers and just want to wish you all a happy Mother's Day. I am forever grateful that God blessed me with a loving mother and I am so thankful that in his grace he has given me an amazing wife and a wonderful mother to my three children. So thank you so much, Michelle, for being such a blessing to me. And uh, today, as we honor our mothers, we are so grateful for each and every one of you and for all that you do to sacrifice for your family to be a blessing uh, to us, and so thank you. And uh, I want to honor two special mothers. I want to recognize two, two special mothers. First of all, I want to recognize our mother with the youngest child, and Miss Sherry has come up here, uh, her and Brother Tommy, can you take some credit for some of these flowers, Miss Sherry? Tommy grows them and I cut. You, and you pray over them, right? I pray over them. <laughs> All right. Well, we, we have some flowers that we want to give to the mother with the youngest child. So I, I think I know who this is today, but I just want to make sure. Do we have any mothers who have a child who is younger than a year old? Oh, that's exactly who I thought it would be, Miss <laughs> Bethany Williams. All right, congratulations, Miss Bethany. Come and receive your prize. All right. And then finally, our eldest mother. Uh, I, I want to ask, do we have any mothers? In fact, I know we do. How about, ladies, if you are uh, a mother who is at least 90 years old, raise your hand. 90 years old. Raise them up high, ladies. Yes. Okay. We, all right. Okay, two back here in the, in the back. All right. Three? All right. Well, they're doing like this. I can't see. Ladies, hey, listen. That is, that is a great accomplishment, and we are so thankful for your, yes, there you go, for your many years of uh, faithfulness as a, as a wife and mother. All right, how about do we have a mother who is 95 years old? All right, that narrowed it down. Our winner today, any more? Did I miss any more? Okay, Miss Joanne Williams, congratulations. Thank you. Miss Joanne, I wouldn't guess that you were a day past 65. You're looking wonderful, doing great, and we congratulate you. All right. Well, today, as we continue in worship, I want us to go to God's Word. And I want to go to a, uh, a passage that is, is one of, I think, one of the most precious passages in the entire uh, Bible. And that is in the Gospel of John. It's John chapter 19. I'm going to ask you to stand as we honor the reading of God's Word. And in uh, John chapter 19, starting in verse 25, we, we see such a, such a uh, precious moment happening as our Lord is hanging on the cross. And just before he gives up his life on the cross to pay for our redemption, he honors his earthly mother, Mary. And so I just wanted to, to read these, uh, these words. Again, we're in John chapter 19, starting in verse 25. The Bible says, Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. And who was that disciple? It was John. And so Jesus there, you know, it's, so, it's such a precious moment there. Is he, I mean, can you imagine? I mean, there is our Savior. 
He is paying our sin debt, but yet in that moment, he still is making sure that his earthly mother would be taken care of after uh, he, he left. And so he, he hands that responsibility over to the apostle uh, disciple John. What a beautiful picture. So today, yes, it is very fitting for us to honor our mothers because we look to our own Lord and we look to his example as he honored his uh, earthly mother as well. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this glorious day. We, we know that as believers we are here today to celebrate the resurrected Lord and all that means for us and we have sang about your amazing grace and we are so thankful for your grace because without your grace we are nothing but today we sing with grateful hearts no matter where we're at in life no matter what situation and struggle we're facing we can still sing with joy knowing that you love us and you have overcome sin and death on the cross and through the resurrection and we celebrate and we thank you today and Lord, part of your many blessings that you have given us is mothers. And so, Lord, I thank you so much for all the mothers. We thank you for all that they do for us. And we pray that they would certainly know how much they are appreciated by us today. And Lord, I am well aware that there are some today that Mother's Day is a very difficult day. Maybe our mothers have, have uh, gone on and they're with you now. Or, or maybe there are some here today and they desire so bad to be a mother Lord, I pray that they would, they would look to you for their strength. Lord, you are the God of all comfort, and we thank you for your grace, for your grace is sufficient. And so, Lord, we pray that you would use the rest of this service to bring honor and glory to your name. And I pray, Holy Spirit, if there is even one here today who has never experienced New Testament salvation, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would bring them to that place of brokenness and repentance and that today would be the day that they call upon the name of the Lord and they uh, are birthed into your kingdom. So Lord, we love you, we thank you and praise you and we ask these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.
As our children make their way to Children's Church, I'm going to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 127. Psalm 127. You see how those children were running? Next Sunday, I expect to see all of our adults running to Sunday school, just like that. <laughs> Excited to learn about God's Word. Just think how encouraging that would be to your Sunday school teacher if they saw you come running in. Psalm 127. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all right, if you will, please stand as we read God's word this morning. Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, children are heritage from the Lord, the fruit of a of the womb, a reward, like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for everyone that is here today. What a blessing this is to see your house filled with people to come and worship you. Lord, we thank you for this time as we now continue in worship by going to your word. We thank you for your word. We thank you that as, uh, as people, we, we live in a, in a very confusing world, but we thank you that we have truth to stand on. Your word is a light to our path, and as long as we keep our focus on you and your word, we will persevere. And so, Lord, teach us, help us to focus for a few moments on what you have for us today. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. All right, so Psalm 127, the title of today's message is, Unless the Lord Builds the House. You know, I don't think that I have to tell you that um, they just don't make things like they used to make things. Would you agree with me on that? And uh, one of the things they don't make like they used to make is houses. You know, houses a long time ago, boy, they just built them to withstand the greatest of, of storms. But so often, newer homes are, are just not built to last. And maybe today you live in a newer home. And so I just was thinking, how do you know? You remember, remember uh, back, it was back in the, I guess it was the 90s, or that, that old saying, you might be a redneck if. Remember that? Well, today I'm going to change that a little bit. And uh, this, is, this is how it goes. You might live in a house that had a bad builder if 
Okay, so how do you know that you're living in a house that wasn't built well? Well, if your house has large cracks in the foundation or the driveway, you may have had a bad builder. If there's straight line cracks in the drywall and nail pops, more than likely your house was built poorly. Another pretty good indication that your house wasn't built well is if you look at your walls and they're uneven. Or if you have sticky doors or hollow exterior doors. Uh, a house that has not been built well will, from the very beginning, oftentimes have plumbing issues. Electrical outlets are sometimes installed upside down. Sagging gutters, another good indication. If you walk into your new home and you stand on the floors and the floors are bouncy like a trampoline, you probably bought a, ba a house that was poorly built. If you have leaky windows or moisture in your crawl spaces or, or basements, those are indicators that your house was poorly built. Sadly, in America, and even within the church, we are seeing growing evidence that many of our homes are poorly built for several reasons. We look at our culture and we see that the, the home is, is, uh, is crumbling all around us. There, uh, I read this interesting statistic. In 1960, 73% of children lived in a two-parent home. But by the year 2014, only 46% of children lived in a two-parent home. We have fatherless homes. There's rise in divorce rates. There's increasing rate of cohabitation. There's more and more homes where the primary breadwinners are, are the mothers. Shrinking fertility rates even among young married couples, rebellious children, estranged family relationships, and even a rise in abuse within the home. Those are all indicators that many of our homes in America, and yes, even oftentimes within the church, many of our homes are poorly built. Now, going all the way back to the very beginning in the book of Genesis, we learn a very foundational truth regarding family, and that is the family is the basic building block for society. So as the family goes, so goes the rest of society. So it's so important that we have homes that are properly built. I don't think that I have to tell you that our culture today is, um, is not exactly for the family. Oftentimes the culture has a, uh, has a misunderstanding of what the family truly is, and so there's a lot of confusion within our uh, culture. And so today, as we celebrate Mother's Day, I want to talk about the family. And I just want to ask ourselves this, this question. Who is the builder of your home? Who is the builder of, of, of my home? And, and so, obviously, we're not in 2 Timothy. We'll go back to 2 Timothy next week. But we go to this psalm in, in, in Psalm 127, and it addresses specifically the family. This particular psalm is, is known as one of the songs of ascent. Of the 150 psalms in the Old Testament, there was 15 of them that were known as the psalms of ascent. And that's because the Israelites, as they were ascending the hill to Jerusalem to worship, they sang these these particular songs. And um, this psalm, you could refer to as a wisdom song. Why do you think that you could, you could refer to this psalm as a wisdom psalm? Solomon is the author of it. Solomon writes this. Solomon didn't write many of the psalms. Often when we think about Solomon, we think more of uh, the book of Proverbs. But here we, we find that this psalm was not written by David. This was written by... David's son, Solomon. And when you think of the family, you think, wow, Solomon was probably not the, the best one to be giving advice on the family. 
I mean, the Bible says that, that Solomon had over 700 wives. Many of them were foreign uh, wives. He, he uh, didn't have the best track record for building a, a godly uh, family. But, you know, some of the best teachers are those who've made the biggest mistakes. I mean, if we'll allow our failures to help us, our, our failures can actually make us wiser. And, and so here is Solomon, and he, he writes this beautiful uh, psalm, again, dealing with the, the family, and specifically having a family that is built by the Lord. And so again, the challenge that is before us today is to ask ourselves, what or who is building our homes? Or what are we building our lives on today? And you know, there's a message for every single one of us today. I, I know that this is Mother's Day, but the beautiful thing about God's Word is it applies to each and every one of us. And so maybe today you're sitting here as a young married couple and you're just starting out, starting a family. There is, there is certainly a word for you today. Or, or maybe you're a, you are a seasoned adult. And I'll let you determine if you fit that category or not. But you today, you're a seasoned adult and, and your children have left the home. There's a word here for you today. Or maybe today you sit here as one and you're a single adult. There is a word here for you today because even as single adults, you still constitute a family. So who is the builder of your home today? Who is building your life today? That's the question that we seek to answer today as we look at this beautiful psalm. And this psalm, it divides itself naturally. Verses 1 through 2 and then verses 3 through 4. So the first section that we look at is in verses 1 through 2, and we get this important truth. Number 1, look to the Lord for the building for the look to the Lord for the building of your home. If the Lord is going to be the builder of our home, there is a principle that we must understand and there is a perspective that we have to keep. Verse 1 gives us this principle. Look at it again. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it, what? They labor in vain. That's a very, very important principle that we have to understand. What is the principle? Well, it's simply this. Whether you are establishing a home or you're trying to establish a business or, a, or even establishing a nation or as believers, if we're working in God's church trying to, to build a, a, a church, whatever the endeavor that you are doing, we must, it is absolutely essential that we do so by totally relying on the Lord to be the one who ultimately builds our homes and our families. In other words, if God, if he's not in charge of our efforts, everything that we do is ultimately in vain. You, you see that word vain used three different times in these first two verses. To, for something to be vain, it means that it's, it's worthless, it's empty, it's, it's pointless. And so you can build a home, you can build a business, but if God is not in it, then everything that you do ultimately amounts to, to nothing. If God is, is if, if he is not behind it, if he is not the one who is ultimately building your life, if he is the one who is not building your family in, in your home, it doesn't matter how much work you pour into it, doesn't matter how much money you pour into it, if he's not in it, all your efforts ultimately are going to be in vain. And your home will be like that, that home that Jesus talked about there in Matthew 7, where he talked about that man who built his home on the sand. And if your home and if your life is, is, is not ultimately being built by the Lord, when the storms of life comes, then the walls of your home are going to quickly crumble. And this is what we see happening all over America and in our, in our society, sadly, 
even again, even within the church, people are trying to build their lives, they're trying to build their families, their homes, and their careers completely apart from God. There is a Latin motto that uh, was used to, to describe, to sum up verse 1. And it goes like this, without the Lord, frustration. That's a good way to put it. No matter what you are endeavoring to do, without the Lord, the end result is going to be frustration. And so he uses two analogies here to, to prove his point. He talks about building a house. Now in the Old Testament language, a house could refer to a physical building. Or it could even refer to a family. And I think that within the context of the rest of the psalm here, uh, I think when he's talking about a house, easily could, could refer to building a, a, a family. Solomon, the, the writer here, he, he was involved in, in many building programs. I mean, the Lord used Solomon to build the first temple. It took, listen to this, it took Solomon 14 years to build his own house. He, and, and certainly, as I already said, with over 700 wives, he, he, he built a, a huge family. But the problem with Solomon was he left the Lord out. And, and so here you are. You, you get married. You, uh, you get jobs and you build a, a house and you, you start having kids and you work hard to invest in your children's life because you want them to succeed and you want to protect them and you can do all that but if you've left God out of the out of the picture then you have accomplished ultimately nothing he is the only one who can make our homes our families and our lives truly successful so he talks about building a house but there's another analogy he uses here and he talks about guarding a city you see that? He says, unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Now, we have to understand the culture of, of this time. In those times, houses were surrounded by walls, like many of us are familiar with the city of Jericho that, that had the, the walls sur surrounding it. And so the principle is, is the same. After you, you build a house, you, you want to secure it and maintain it. And so you, you make sure that there's walls and that there is a watchman that would stand on those walls that would alert to any incoming uh, uh, danger. Solomon, certainly, he, he built walls and had many watchmen for security. But in the end, his kingdom crumbled because ultimately he looked to himself for his security and not the Lord. We want security in our lives, right? We want security for our, our families and for our homes and, and, and we can put our, our trust in having good paying jobs and having nice cars and, and nice houses and we can work really hard to provide the security by having big savings accounts. How many of you have big savings accounts? I didn't think so, right? You're in good company. Or maybe you say, you know, I'm going to work really hard because I want the security of knowing that I have a, have a, a retirement plan that is that is there for me when I retire and we have insurance policies and maybe you even today you have a a cancer insurance policy and, and all those things are fine but if that is your security and, and 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 it's not God who's ultimately providing your your security and he is not your ultimate trust then all your efforts to build security are useless Psalm 33, verses 16 through 18 says, The king is not saved by a mighty army. Now, were armies important? Yeah, and they served their purposes. A warrior is not delivered by great strength. A horse is false hope for victory, nor does it deliver anyone by its great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope for his loving kindness you know what i think what we're discovering in america for so long we've looked to the mighty dollar to be our security but if we look to the mighty dollar to be our security and we've left god out to be our ultimate source of security we're struggling right now 
And, and that's what the, the psalmist is getting at. And then you go down to verse 2, and he talks about this perspective. If we're going to look to God to build our homes and build our lives, we have to keep this, this perspective. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Now, the psalmist here, he, he's, not, he's not giving an excuse for laziness. So you can't leave here today and say, praise God, the preacher gave me a reason why I don't have to work anymore. That's not what the psalmist is saying. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, Paul says, if you don't work, guess what? You don't eat. Proverbs, uh, Solomon wrote in Proverbs chapter 6 and verses 6 through 11, he, he talked about the, the dangers of slothfulness. But, but what he's getting at it here is this. Building a house and, and protecting a city certainly involves hard work. Building our lives and building our family, it involves a lot of work, and sometimes we get up really early in the morning. Matthew and Bethany, occasionally they get up really early in the middle of the night, right? Uh, and so there's certainly hard work involved, but if, if your trust is is in your hard work, then you're in trouble. That's, that's what he's getting at here in verse 2. If your hope is in the fact that you are working really, really hard to supply for your family, to provide security for your family, and you're leaving God out, the result is going to be a lot of anxiety and worry and a lot of sleepless nights. And, and that's why he... He says, eating the bread of anxious toil. And so we have to be careful that our, our work doesn't exclude God, that we don't live like practical atheists. I think most of us in here, we would say, oh, I believe in God. But practically speaking, do we really believe that God is the one who is going to build our families? Do we really believe that God is sovereign and that he is providential and he's working behind the scenes of our lives to, to work out the affairs of our, of our lives? If we don't trust that, uh, again, we're going to work really hard all day long and then we're going to go home and we're still not going to be able to rest. We're going to lie awake with lots of anxiety and worry, feeling like we still haven't done enough because we've convinced ourselves that our homes totally are dependent upon us instead of trusting the Lord. You know, I wonder how many of you wives and, and mothers, you, you work really hard to make sure your house is completely spotless. You... You want to make sure all the laundry's done, and then you go to bed, and you still can't rest because you hadn't got it all done. Or how many men out there, they, they're neglecting their families because they're working late into the night, convinced that they need that extra money in order to provide for their families. Again, certainly we should be people who are known for hard work, but if, we're, if our trust is ultimately in our hard work and we're not trusting in the Lord for the working of our lives, we'll have no rest. But when we have this perspective that says, you know what, I'm going to do all that is expected of me as a husband, as a wife, uh, I'm going I'm to work really hard, I'm going to do everything that I need to do, but at the end of the day, I'm going to go to bed and I'm going to rest knowing that God's got it all covered. Well, there's a sweet rest in that. Do you rest well at night? I, I wonder, senior adults, you've worked really hard your whole life and you've built up a retirement account, but do you have rest at night or do you lay in bed at night worrying that that retirement account is going to run out too soon. He says, the Lord gives rest to those who ultimately look to him. Isaiah 26, 3 and 4, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon you. All right, so we've seen this 
this first truth. Look to the Lord for the building of your home. Today, is the Lord building your house? Is He the one that you're ultimately trusting and depending upon to build your marriage, your home, your, your, your career, whatever it is? Secondly, the second and final truth we get in verses 3 through 5. Look to the Lord for the raising of your family. Look to the Lord for the raising of your, your family. When it comes to raising a family, it is absolutely imperative that we trust in the Lord to raise our, our, our families. And so there in verse 3, Solomon says, ultimately it's the Lord who provides our children. He's the one who provides our children. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. And so we know that our children ultimately come to us from God. And, and, I, and I am aware that maybe there are some today, and you so desire to have children. And for whatever reason, you haven't been able to have any yet. You just, and this may sound cliche, and forgive me if it does, but just continue to trust the Lord that he provides us children in his timing and in his way. Continue to look to the Lord. But, but as, as we look at verse 3, we get God's perspective on children. He says children are what? They're an inheritance, right? They're, they are a gift from our Heavenly Father given to us. And, and it goes on to say that not only they're an inheritance, but they are a, a, a reward. So no wonder Solomon says, blessed is the man whose quiver is full of these rewards. And, and, and so this should shape the way that we view children. And, and I don't think I have to tell you that over this past week, obviously, in many ways, our culture is very confused as to their understanding of children. Children are a blessing from the Lord. And it's sad when so often we view children as a burden. We, we view children as, a, as an inconvenience. And statistically speaking, couples, younger couples are waiting longer and longer to have children because they just feel like they just can't afford it or the children are an inconvenience to their careers and all these uh, sort of things. And I'm not here to tell you when to have children, but I am just saying that we should allow the Word of God to, to form the way that we view children, that they truly are a blessing from the Lord. And so we have to trust that God gives us children. But then in verse 4, we have to trust God to nurture our children. He, he says, behold, uh, or excuse me, verse 4, I'm in, verse, I'm in Psalm 128. Psalm 127, verse 4, like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Now, newsflash, our children, they don't come to us as arrows. They don't start out as arrows. They start out as handfuls. And we have to trust the Lord to nurture our children so that we train them so that they will become those errors, those arrows that God can use to do great things for his, his uh, kingdom. And, and so as parents and as grandparents, we have to, well, we have to totally depend and look to the Lord to help us to, to nurture our children. And so it's our responsibility to teach our children about Jesus. We, we can't get enough of Jesus into our children. To train our children to understand the gospel and their need for the gospel. And certainly, if, if we're going to nurture our children that, that in a way that honors the Lord, we've got to keep our children in church. Don't ever believe that lie that says, well, you know, I'm just going to let my children make that choice for themselves. You've been given the responsibility to have your children in church. You don't say, well, you go to church wherever you want to go to church. You say, no, we're going to be in church this Sunday, and this is the church that you're going to be in. You're going to be with us as a family. 
And we certainly we have to pray for them and we have to, we have to model for them a gospel-centered life. And so as our children look to us as parents, they hopefully see love and grace and forgiveness and service in our, in our homes. And you know something else that's fitting for us as uh, parents and grandparents, something that will model the gospel for our children is this idea of confession and repentance. Our children need to see in us as adults modeling for them confession and repentance. You say, what are you talking about? Well, there's times, parents, that we mess up, right? That sometimes we've done something wrong towards our spouse or, or towards our children, and those are some of the greatest teaching moments that we have for our children because it's in those moments that we can go to our children and we can say, listen, I've got to be totally honest with you. I was wrong, and I confess that, and, 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 and I need to, to seek your forgiveness. That, that demonstrates authentic Christianity to our children and to our, our grandchildren. And, and so we... we we raise them in such a way that God can use them for his, his glory, nurturing them in the ways of the Lord. And so, so, so we train them so that God can form them into to arrows, but then we have to trust God when it comes time to release those arrows. Arrows are designed not to stay in the quiver. Arrows are designed to be released. And, and I mean, what, what's the point of having arrows if you never let them fly? God gives us children for a brief time so that we can nurture them in the ways of the Lord and then we get to bow that, that uh, bow and arrow back and let those arrows fly. But you know what? If we're not careful, let's just be honest. If we're not careful our children and our grandchildren can very easily become our idols. And it gets really quiet in here. I mean, it can be very, very tempting to look to our children to be our source of ultimate strength and comfort. And yes, we should love our children and we should enjoy our children, but anything that we look to to give us that ultimate strength and comfort it doesn't matter what it is even if it's our children they've become an idol and when our children our grandchildren become idols then it gets very hard for us to let them fly out into the world and it's it becomes hard for us to let them go but we learn here from the psalm that, that we're to raise our children and love them in the Lord and, 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 and trust the Lord to mold them into faithful followers of Christ. And then at the appropriate age, we're to encourage them to leave. Amen, parents? Amen. We love them. And, and we adore them. And we will always support them. But we want to see them leave. Because that's what God designed them, to, to leave the nest. And parents, after they leave, we got to let go. We can't keep trying to, to control our children. You, you've seen a, uh, a spear fisherman, they have that arrow and they release that arrow, but there's a string that's attached to that arrow. And if we're not careful... We let our children fly, but we keep a string attached to them because what are we trying to do? We're trying to continue to control our, our children. And when we're doing that, who are we trusting? We have to trust God to nurture them and train them the best that we're able to do. And then we let them fly and we trust our children over to the Lord. And there may be times that after we let them fly that they mess up really bad and they hurt us. But it's in those moments that we just continue to trust our children over to the Lord. And then verse 5. 
He says, children, they're a blessing. They're an heritage from the Lord. They're a reward. Why is that? Because arrows, like arrows, our children can be used to do great things. And he says there in verse 5, Blessed is the man who's, who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gates. In ancient times, children were very, very important. Having children was 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 very important, especially having sons. You, you wanted to have sons so that your son could carry on the family name. But another reason why it was a blessing to have many children is because back in those days, they didn't have retirement homes. They didn't have travel nurses that could come in and, and take care of us when we get older. Or we, in those days, you looked to your children, and they would be the ones who would, who would come and they would... They would take care of their, of their uh, parents. And, 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 and then he says, he shall not be put to shame when, when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. What is he talking about there? Well, in those days, you, you, would, you would go to the city gates to settle disputes. So if you had a dispute with one of your neighbors, you would go to the, to the city gates where the elders met and you would, you would uh, resolve those disputes. And, and a man who had many children would have many voices to speak up on his behalf. Charles Spurgeon, he said, Nobody cares to meddle with a man who can gather a clan of brave sons around him. And so we have to, we have to look to the Lord for the building of our homes, for the building of our lives. And then secondly, we have to look to the Lord for the raising of our families. So in the way of application, I just have one simple word of application today. That's simply this. Establish your life, your home, your family on the Lord. Very simple. Nothing profound there. But I think that's the, that's the central truth that we get out of this text. This challenge is that we're to to seek to establish our life and our home and our family on the Lord. Is the Lord the builder of your home today? Is he the builder of your family? Is he the builder of your life? And what does this look like? How do I know? How do I know that my home, my life, my family is being built by the Lord? Well, if he's building your life, if he's building your home, first and foremost, he is your foundation. The foundation of the home is everything. If you have a bad foundation, you have a bad home all over. If we're going to have homes that God is building, he has to be our foundation. And what is that foundation? It is the Word of God. It is the Word of God that that determines how we function as husband and wife and as children. And it is the Word of God that provides that foundation for us as families when we go through really shaky times. If the Lord is building your family and your home today, if He's building your life, He is your head. He is the one that we look to for our direction. He is your strength. If your home is being built by the Lord, He is your priority. That means that like Joshua, as for me and my house, we will what? We will serve the Lord. He comes first in your home. Is that true in your life? Does the Lord come first in your home and in your life? We all are familiar with the words of Jesus in Matthew 6, verse 33. Many of us could quote those words. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. If he's building your home and your life, he is your hope. Don't you praise God that as believers we have hope in Christ? Because as Christian homes, we're going to have trials, we're going to have difficulties, there will be disappointments, and yes, there will be times as mothers that you fail miserably. And there will be plenty of times, more times than mothers, that we dads, we mess up really bad. But in Christ, we have hope because he died on the cross for our failures. And a home that's being built on the Lord has the Lord as their, as their hope. A home that is being built by the Lord, listen to this, it means that He is your satisfaction. You say, what do you mean by that, preacher? 
it means that if Christ is the center of your home, ultimately you have everything that you need. You know what? Homes that are satisfied in having Jesus, they don't feel this pressure to keep up with the Joneses. If Jesus Christ is your greatest treasure in your life, if he is the priority of your life, you don't have to have the biggest house on the street. You don't have to always be buying a brand new car every two years. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with buying a brand new car every two years. In fact, if you're able to do that, God bless you. But if that's what you're looking to, to give you your satisfaction, you will never be satisfied. But homes that are being built by the Lord, they're filled with satisfaction because Christ is their head and He is their source of hope. And finally, how do I, how do I know that today my family, my life, my home is being built by the Lord? If your house is being built by the Lord, He is your motivation. He is your motivation. Ultimately, everything that you do, your goal for your home and for your life and your marriage is to ultimately honor the Lord Jesus Christ so that his great name will be magnified throughout your sphere of influence. And the truth is, as we've talked about building our houses and our lives upon the Lord, and, and we've seen that the only way that our, our lives can be built upon the Lord is by completely depending upon Him. The reality is, we can't depend upon Him unless, listen, we can't depend upon Him unless we depend upon Him to help us depend upon Him. Now that's just a little something for you to go home and think about. We can't even depend upon the Lord unless we depend upon the Lord to help us to depend upon the Lord. You say, preacher, wow, this is way too late in your sermon to be throwing something like that into us. But the point is this, outside of God's grace, we are nothing. And we need him for every area of our life. And may we look to him and depend upon him for everything. Is your house being built by the Lord? Well, let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word today. You instruct us, you teach us about the family and we look about our culture today, and certainly we're concerned about the condition of families and homes across our nation. And, and, and we, we shouldn't be surprised because so many, and maybe there are even some here today, and they're seeking to build their lives, they're seeking to build their homes outside of depending upon you. You're not the center of their lives. And so, Lord, I, I pray that we would lean upon you. We have nothing to boast about today. It is only by your grace that we stand. And so, Lord, I, I pray for maybe that family today, and they've lived far too long with a home that is void of you. I pray that today they would build a new foundation for their home, that they would put you first in their lives. I, I pray for those families that they're struggling and they they want to have children and they know that children are a blessing from the lord and they so desire to receive that blessing i, I pray that you would help them by your grace to continue to wait upon you lord i pray that no matter how old we are today that our ultimate trust will not be in our own efforts but that at night we will rest well knowing that you never sleep nor slumber that even while we are sleeping, you're working on our behalf. Lord, today if there is even one, and they're good moral people, they pay their bills on time, they're great neighbors, they're even faithful to come to church, but they've never trusted Jesus Christ to be their Lord and Savior. I pray that today you would bring conviction to their hearts, you would grant them the grace to turn from their sins, and to place their faith in Christ and Christ alone for their salvation. What greater day to do that than on this glorious day of Mother's Day 2022. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, at this time, I want to invite you to stand as we have our hymn of invitation. It is during this time, if you have a need, you, you, you say, 
preacher, I've got this question. I've got a burden on my heart. I have a spiritual need. I, maybe I want to, uh, I, I'm not sure that I have a home in heaven, but I want to leave today knowing for sure I'm saved. You step out of your, your seat as we begin singing. You come, and we'll help you with that need. If you just want to come to the altars and pray, maybe some of you husbands, what a great idea it would be to come to the altars this, this morning. And you just want to pray on behalf of your wife. And you want to pray that God would, would bless her and encourage her. And you just want to thank the Lord for giving you a godly wife and a godly mother to your children. Maybe some of your ladies, you know, you say, boy, I've messed up really bad as a mother. Guess what? You're in good company because we've all messed up really bad. Just remember Jesus Christ, he loves you and he's a patient God and his grace is sufficient. Whatever you need to do, you do as we sing hymn number 414, softly and tenderly. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching. Watching for you and for me. Come home, come home. You are weary, come home. Tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O oh sinner, come home. Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you? And for me, ah, he lay not his, lay not his mercies, mercies for you and for me. Come home. Come home, ye who are weary, come home, earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, Well, again, I want to wish all of our mothers a happy Mother's Day. I hope that you have a wonderful afternoon spending time with your family. It's been a good day in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. God is good, and he is gracious, and he is sufficient. So I'm going to close us in a word of prayer. I'll be in the back to greet you as you leave. I hope that you have a wonderful afternoon. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, again, we thank you so much for this great day of worship that you've given us. Lord, we thank you that no matter what we go through in life, we know that we always have hope because you're alive. Lord Jesus, I again pray for all of our mothers today that you would bless them. For all of our ladies, encourage them. We're living in some difficult times, but Lord, we thank you that you are our rock and our strength. Bless us as we leave, and may we be a blessing to you, and we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.